I'm delighted that you've made it your decision to be here tonight, and I hope that you are prepared to continue our study of the evidence for faith. We're tonight going to deal with evolution. We dealt with creation last week, made a little adjustment in our schedule of studies, as we mentioned last week. Um, some changes needed to be made. So next week, we're going to be dealing with the Genesis flood. Following that, we'll talk about archaeology. Then we'll get into the historical Jesus and the resurrection of Christ. On the 7th of February, we'll end up this series by three lessons on Sunday. And uh, Brother King will be here, and he'll be talking about plenary inspiration of the Scriptures on the Bible class period. And then he'll talk about the canonization of the Scriptures, and then he'll talk about the Apocrypha to close out our studies on evidence for faith. Last time we talked about creation, evidence for creation. And in that we looked at the following points. We know that the Genesis account of creation is true based upon the fact that God is. That is, we've looked at evidence in two lessons on evidence for the existence of God and because of the evidence being strong that there is a God, that gives us evidence that creation indeed is true. Secondly, we considered that created, God had created all things in six literal days. We looked at the Genesis account and looked at the six literal days of creation. We also looked at the evidence for a relatively young earth. That argues for creation. Evolution demands that there be millions, actually billions of years, for there to be enough time. There's not enough time because of the relatively young earth that we talked about. And then we drew some conclusions from that. As we looked at the evidence for creation, our conclusions that we drew were the fact that creation took place in a very short process of time, that creation was at the command of God, fiat creation, meaning that it was not a gradual thing, that there were the first plants, the first animals, and first men were full grown. We concluded that from Genesis 1 and 2. We talked about how that animals and plants reproduce after their kind. There was one original man, evolution would say the opposite of that, and woman came from a rib of man, and we also saw that in the beginning man sinned and was in need of redemption. Those conclusions are true if the Genesis account of creation is true. I want us to look at the flip side of that and continue that study by looking at problems with evolution. Let's talk about some of the problems we have with evolution. Let's first of all define what evolution is. Evolution comes from a word which simply means to roll out or to roll forth or to unfold or to open up or to work out or develop gradually. The word evolution is not wrong within itself. There are some aspects of the concept of something changing and evolving that we believe, that creationists believe, Bible believers believe, and we'll talk about that in just a second. The popular de definition of uh, evolution is the fact that it says that man came from a monkey. The more proper definition is the fact that man and all animal life came from a common ancestor from a single cell. That's the concept of evolution. The Evolution Handbook for Students says the theory of evolution may be defined as the hypothesis that millions of years ago, lifeless matter acted upon by natural forces gave origin to one or more of the organisms which have evolved into all living and extinct plants and animals, including man. That's the concept of evolution that is opposite of the concept of divine creation. Now let's talk a little more about the concept of evolution and what some believe with reference to evolution. When we talk about evolution, there is the evolution of the animate creation. And that is that man evolved from an amoeba. That man evolved from some single cell and developed into what he is. There is another aspect of creation that involves the inanimate creation that the earth began with a big bang and then took billions of years to cool and to stabilize. Now, the reason I talk about those two things, those who believe in the atheistic form of evolution, they believe both aspects of evolution. Some of our own brethren have bought into the concept of theistic evolution. And they do not believe that man evolved in this, this animate creation involving evolution, but they believe in the inanimate creation involving evolution. They believe the earth may have began with a big bang and that it took billions of years for it to stabilize and to cool off. That God may have created man, but the earth began with this big bang and so we have the millions and millions of years. So it's an effort to try to harmonize the Genesis account with that of evolution and therefore they put millions of years in Genesis chapter 1 and actually billions of years. Let's consider the fact that evolution is a theory and not a fact. Evolution has many missing links. We'll talk about those as the lesson unfolds. This is a quotation from 
Darwin's Origin of Species and the Centennial Edition, Dr. L. Harrison Matthew says, the theory of evolution is so plausible that we accept it as though it were a proven fact. Now that's in the, the preface or the introduction of Darwin's own book. That it is so plausible we accept it as though it were a fact. That tells us it's a theory that is not indeed a fact. If it is taught at all in our school systems, and it is, it should be presented as a theory that has not been proven, and we'll give evidence that it hasn't been proven as the lesson unfolds. So let's begin listing some of the problems with evolution. What are they? We cannot be exhaustive. We're only getting the beginning of the list. First of all, there, are no, there is no evidences. There is no evidence of change without limits. There is no evidence of change without limits. That has to be for evolution to be true. There is no evidence of change without limits. I want us to distinguish between the special theory of evolution and the general theory of evolution. When we talk about the special theory of evolution, we're talking about changes within limits, or what might be referred to as microevolution. When we talk about the general theory of evolution, what we're talking about is changes without limits. We're talking about macroevolution. These two illustrations, I credit Farrell Jenkins with those. And when I first saw those, that gave me the concept, I understand what they're talking about when they talk about the difference between the special theory and the general theory of evolution. The special theory of evolution says that there are changes within limits, that there are changes from, from, uh, from one to the other, but there's changes within limits. There isn't much change, but there's slight changes and variation. But that's within limits. That's called microevolution. Here we have an illustration of changes without limits where it changes from one group into another group into another group into another group. I want to suggest to you that the first can be proven. When the evolutionist wants to present to you evidence of evolution, what they will present is evidence of microevolution. That is, changes within limits. Darwin's finches would be one example of that. His giraffe study would be another example of that. We'll talk about those in a moment. But those are changes within limits. Here we have changes without limits, and that cannot and has not been proven. When the evolutionist comes along and he wants to prove this, he proves that that's true, that is, that the special theory is true, and therefore he assumes that this is also true. And we'll give you evidence of that as that unfolds. We're still driving at the point that there is no evidence of changes without limits. What can be presented is there are changes within limits, but no evidence of changes without limits. And so when someone says, do you not believe in evolution? Well, tell me what you're talking about before I ask, answer that question. Are you talking about the special theory where there are changes within limits? I do believe that. Are you talking about changes without limits in the general theory of evolution? No, I do not believe that, and I reject that wholeheartedly. Now let's talk about some of the evidence of that. Here's Darwin's finches. Darwin observed some finches off of the coast of South, uh, South America. And as he observed these finches, he observed the changes in their beaks. That over a period of time, as he studied those, there was a change that, as they adapted to the, to the uh, food that they were eating and to the, uh, to the grain that they were eating. And from that, he developed the view of natural selection and later the concept of evolution. But I want you to notice this about Darwin's finches. That as he presented the idea of the finches, I observed these finches and I noticed their beaks have changed. And they were evolving. And as they began to eat things, it, it, I noticed over a period of years there was a change. Notice that the finches stayed as finches and they never became cats or goats or dogs. They didn't change from one group into another group into another group. I'll come back to that illustration, that, that graph that I credit uh, Farrell Jenkins with in a moment. But you notice what he just proved was changes within limits. He did not prove changes without limits. Well, Darwin talked about the survival of the fittest. In that, the evolutionists cite the giraffe as an example of that. That is, due to the severe droughts, they tell us that the lower leaves of the trees were eaten and then they uh, all died. And only the giraffes with the longest neck were those who survived. The survival of the fittest, you see. The long-necked giraffes would mate, and therefore they passed along that long-necked trait to their offspring, 
And so that's how they developed. They started out with a smaller neck and a shorter neck, and it grew because they, could, they were the ones who could reach the leaves at the top. Well, let's respond to that. Now, that was an interesting thing because what he shows, if that be true, and we'll grant that that's true for argument's sake, that the giraffe developed a longer neck over a period of time. The question becomes, then how did the other animals without long necks ever survive? Now, the fossil record would show that other animals besides the giraffe survived. How did they survive if they couldn't reach those leaves? How did they survive? You talk about the survival of the fittest, how did they survive? And then why did other leaf-eating animals not develop long necks like the giraffe? The giraffes weren't the only one that ate the leaves, but there were other animals that would eat the leaves, but how did the other animals survive? How did they not develop the long necks like the giraffe did? The female neck of the giraffe is two foot shorter than the male neck. Why didn't the female grow as long as, if it's developing and growing and evolving, why didn't it develop as long? Those are questions that the evolutionists haven't answered. But if we were to grant what, what Darwin talks about in the survival of the fittest, if he's correct about the giraffes, we have to recognize the fact that the giraffe only gave birth through other giraffes. It didn't expand into other species, and that doesn't tell us how other species then were developed. Again, you have changes within limits. You don't change from one group into another group into another group. Darwin talked about mutations. Simply defined, mutations is a sudden alteration within a species. Does that happen? Certainly it does. The creationist has to admit that there's been radical changes within a species. For example, you have the hornless cattle, you have the short-legged sheep, you have the seedless orange. Those are examples of mutations. But I'll tell you what doesn't happen. You don't have a radical change from one group into another group. The cow doesn't become a cat, and the cat doesn't become a cow. The sheep doesn't become a horse. And the orange didn't become a pear or pineapple. Now, that would have been interesting if you could show that the orange finally developed until it was seedless, and then it turned into a pear, and then it turned into a pineapple, and then it turned into an apple. What you have are changes within limits again. You have changes within limits. Mutations are totally in, in, uh, incapable of creating anything new. They only change the existing structure. There is no evidence of the evolution. Now let's go back to this chart that I again credit Farrell Jenkins with. And that is what we've just seen, whether you're talking about the giraffe, whether you're talking about mutations, or whether we're talking about Darwin's finches, what they have proven is that there are changes within limits, microevolution, that can be proven, evidence has been given, and they have assumed, therefore, that this is true, changes without limits, changes from one group into another group into another group. Now, you remember that when evidence is presented, someone might talk about Darwin's finches, they may talk about the giraffe, they may talk about the seedless finch, they may talk about mutation, they're giving you evidence of changes within limits. They have not proven changes without limits. Here's a second problem with evolution. It denies the law of biogenesis. The law of biogenesis simply defines, says, life comes from existing life. Evolution believes that in the spontaneous generation of life, that life just spontaneously generates. They have to believe that. Without that concept, they cannot believe in the theory of evolution. The Genesis account, as we noticed last evening, talks about the fact that life came from God. We won't take the time to read again the Genesis account. We see it again in Acts 17. Life came from God. God, having life, created all things. And so the creationist does not believe in the spontaneous generation of life. I won't bore you with this quotation, with the details of this quotation. Lazarus Spallanzani in the 1700s followed up a test where he took... Uh, what he called this gravy. It was a broth that had microorganisms in them, and he began to boil it to the point that everything was killed within it. And he put one, and he sealed one off completely, and he left the other one in open air. And what he's trying to show is, or trying to test is, whether or not there is the spontaneous generation of life. If there is spontaneous generation of life, the one that is sealed off, though that all microorganisms have been killed, ought to have life produced in it. There was no life produced in the one that was completely sealed. And so what he demonstrated was that there is no spontaneous generation of life. Well, a little bit later, there was the one who was most noted for that, Louis Pasteur. He did the same thing, except he took this flask that had a curved neck on it, S-curve, much like you'd have a, a trap underneath your sink, that cuts off the airflow. And he, again, put this gravy, something similar to what had been done before and has boiled it to the point and he's killed off all microorganisms, and if there is a spontaneous generation of life, there should be life within. He left it for a year. 
there is no life beginning to grow. He breaks the neck off so that air and dust can get in and suddenly within a day there's microorganisms beginning to grow and he demonstrated again there is no spontaneous generation of life. And evolution demands that there is the spontaneous generation of life. Evolution begins with the following assumptions. That spontaneous genera generation of life occurred. Their theory is based on that concept. That spontaneous generation of life occurred. Secondly, that spontaneous spontaneous generation of life occurred only once. Why isn't it happening again and again and again? They assume that. And thirdly, that plants and animals and men and viruses and bacteria all are interrelated. We have a common ancestor. We have to. And evolution begins with that assumption or those assumptions along with many, many more. Here's a third problem with the theory of evolution. It denies the law of thorough dynamics. Simply defined... The second law of thorough dynamics says the earth is wearing out. Listen to the quotation from Cal Butt, who is with Apologetics Press. Thorough dynamics is just a long word used to discuss the way that matter and energy behave in nature. Stated simply, the second law of thorough dynamics says that matter and energy are moved toward a less usable, more disorderly state called entropy. The late Isaac Asimov, the famous evolutionist, wrote about the second law. Another way of stating the second law is the universe is constantly getting more disorderly. For instance, when a person puts gasoline into the vehicle, the energy in that gasoline is usable, but after the gasoline burns, much of the energy escapes into the atmosphere and cannot be used again. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So what does that have to do with evolution? Well, two things. One is that harmonizes with Hebrews chapter 1. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1 just for a moment. Because of the nature of the material, we're looking at some of the external evidences, and we're not spending a great deal of time with our text. So let's take a moment to look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, when we were studying Hebrews 1, it was probably pointed out in your Bible class that here is evidence that of the scientific foreknowledge of God. Because it talks about a very principle of the second law of thermodynamics. This is a quotation from Psalm 102, but nonetheless... Beginning at verse 10, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, the earth, the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. Now notice verse 11. And they will grow old like a garment. They're wearing out like a garment. The world is wearing out. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Furthermore, verse 12, like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will change, but you are the same and your years will not fail. But he says the world is wearing out, wearing down. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Now evolution must have the world constantly building itself up and improving. If evolution is working, it's going in the other direction. Instead of wearing out and, and going down, it ought to be building itself up. We're evolving. Things are getting better. Remember, we went from the single cell to man. Why did it stop? It denies the second law of thorough dynamics. Fourthly, what's wrong with the theory of evolution? It denies fixity of kinds. Please be advised that the Bible does not teach fixity of species, but it does teach fixity of kinds. That is, Genesis chapter 1, the plant would reproduce after its kind, the animal would re reproduce after its kind, and man would reproduce after his kind. Genesis 1, 11 and 12, verse 21, 24, and 25. Now, here's a quote from Wayne Jackson, who writes quite often for Apologetics Press. He said, what the... Uh, the creationist insist is this. The Bible does not allow for the notion that all biological life forms have descended from a co common ancestor or even a few initial forms. Invertebrates have not produced vertebrates. Fish do not evolve into reptiles. Reptiles do not become birds, and birds are not transformed into mammals. The creationists believe both Scripture and science support, listen to this carefully, horizontal variation, changes within limits, with, at, within basic kinds, not vertical evolution changes without limits. There's a vast difference between the two. See, the Bible teaches fixity of kinds, not fixity of species, but fixity of kinds. The Bible shows that there is fixity of kinds, and that agrees with what the record shows. Evolution denies the fixity of kinds. Let's go to the fossil record for a moment. The fossil records say no. How? Well, if evolution be true, if the theory of evolution be true, the gradual development of plant and animal life should be embedded in successive layers. 
Because remember, the, the layers, as we talked about in the geological um, strata, that, that it uh, didn't come suddenly, if evolution be true, as the creationist believes, in some cases, like we saw the tree buried over here at Cookville in our study last time. But it happened over millions of years. So you have millions of years, and then you have millions of years, and then millions of years. And embedded in those, that fossil record ought to be a number of those intermediate changes. More evidence of that. Darwin himself said the number of intermediate and transitional links between all living and extinct species must have been inconceivably great. That's Darwin himself. Darwin says there ought to have been a number of those. It just it ought to be an inconceivably great of that, those transitional forms buried somewhere in the fossil record. There ought to be. If evolution be true, there should be as many transitional fossils that show the gradual changes as those that were not transitional. Get this point. And when somebody talks about the fossil record, ask your professor, ask your evolutionary friend, Ask them about the fossil record. There are no intermediate fossils. There are none. Those that were thought to be fall into three categories, and we'll come to that in just a moment. Again, Darwin in The Origin of Species said, Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious, serious objection, which could be urged against the theory. The explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. He said, we don't have much of that, that, those transitional fossils. They're just not around. And that's because there's a problem with the, with the geological record. Not the fact that they're not there. We just can't find them, is the point that he's making. And we'll come back to the fossil record in just a moment. But I want to spend just a little bit talking about there's not enough time for the evolutionist. There's just not enough time. The evolutionist, that's one of the problems, there's not enough time. We've, we've talked about a relatively young earth and gave evidence of that in our last study. The evolutionist needs billions of years. Some have argued at the beginning of the concepts of evolution, uh, in the early days of, ev of the evolutionary theory, that we need millions of years. Carl Sagan rightly said we need billions and billions of years that there are billions of years that have to be for the evolutionary record to take place. They need that much time. The evidence for a young earth doesn't allow that. We won't go back through those evidences. Go back to our previous study. It's online, and if you want to look, consider those or you missed that particular lesson. Let's talk about some of the dating methods. I've been asked, could we address some of the dating methods? Some of the dating methods that are supposed to prove millions of years, like uh, carbon-14, radiocarbon, or the potassium-argon, dating, and there's some other methods that we won't get into, but those are two of the po most popular, where things have been dated, maybe it's the, uh, a rock has been dated, and it's been dated at uh, 10 million years old, or 30 million years old, or maybe it's 3 billion years old, or whatever the case may be. Let's talk about some of the problems with that, and obviously this is a field where I'll, d I'll defer to the experts, and I'll, I'll give quotation from them. This is from the Creation Research so Society. I've mentioned that in our question and answer period in the back. I want to su suggest to you the dating methods are based upon assumption. So listen to this quotation from Dr. Uh, Whitelaw. He said, both clocks, both dating methods, are absolutely dependent upon accurate knowledge of a tiny constituent in the Earth's atmosphere at the time of the event being dated. The radiocarbon clock assumes, based on assumption, that the C14 concentration throughout the living world was the same at the, at the death of the specimen as it is today. So they start with an assumption when they're dating that. Secondly, he goes on to say this assumption is based upon two prior assumptions. A, that the production rate of C14 in the outer atmosphere had long before approached equilibrium with the decay rate, that is, that creation, if it occurred at all, was long before the living matter. And B, that no cosmic event occurred in the last 45,000 years that could possibly change the C14 production rate or the decay rate. You say, I got lost in that and I didn't get that. Well, here's... Dr. Whitelaw simply saying that whether you're talking about the carbon-14 or the potassium-argon dating, it is based upon assumption, and that assumption is based upon more assumptions. And they start with an assumption before they ever come up with a date, and therefore that's evidence that this rock is, happens to be millions of years old. Dwayne Gish, who has debated evolution time and time again, Dr. Gish, in his book, The, uh, the Fossil Record Says No, said it should be realized that there is no direct method for determining the age of any rock. 
radio chronologists must resort to indirect methods which involve certain basic assumptions. So when someone says, well, we've dated this rock and it is 30 million years old, they base that upon assumption. We've talked about assumptions over and over again in this whole series. Dr. Gertler, we quoted from him earlier, Brother Gertler, in his book, Unraveling Evolution, said this. I want you to see that he's talking about that they, they miss their mark. They assume millions, but the world's not that old. He said, interesting, although coal was supposedly formed hundreds of millions of years ago, no coal has ever been found that was completely devoid of carbon-14. This demonstrates that these fossil fuels are in the neighborhood of thousands and not millions of years. Dr. Gutler says that if it still has that, then it's not billions of years or millions of years. They're in thousands of years. The earth is just not that old. Another quotation from Dr. Gutler. He said another example of the dubious nature of the radiometric dating when seen, when, is seen when some rock specimens were formed from five locations. Now this one's interesting. From five locations of the new lava dome at Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Although the rock was created only 11 years earlier, radiometric dating, by the potassium argon method, assigned the dates between a half and three million years. Now, the rock lava was only 11 years old. Steve Rudd and Don Patton suggest in this chart that they've put out that Mount St. Helens, that, that same rock, that, that in five different locations, they dated it at a, at a half a million years up to three million years old, and the rock was only formed 11 years earlier. The same rock. What does that tell you? That tells me the dating method is not accurate, and it's based upon assumptions. I want to spend the rest of our time talking about the eight man findings. The eight man findings. What I want you to see is that some of the, ev the evidence that has been presented, I mentioned in a, in a previous study, there's the difference between evidence and interpretation of the evidence. I want to go through that again because someone made a comment or two after that that, that either helped them or some got a little confused on that illustration. Let's talk about the difference in evidence and interpretation of the evidence. When someone says evidence can be presented or evidence has been found or evidence has been discovered that proves there was an ape like man that wasn't an ape nor a man but an ape like man, what they're saying is that is the interpretation of our evidence. The illustration I gave a couple of times ago or maybe it was last week was in court that there is the evidence presented but there's the interpretation of the evidence. Where the prosecutor says, this man is guilty of the murder because his fingerprints were on the gun that killed the man. Now the fact his fingerprints were on the gun is the evidence that has been presented. The fact that that man did the shooting is the interpretation of the evidence. There's more explanation of how his fingerprints got there. It might have been his gun that he sold. He might have touched that gun somewhere. It might have been stolen from him. There are a number of ways his fingerprints might be on the gun and it still be the murder weapon and him not do that. There's a difference in the evidence and the interpretation of the evidence. Let me give you some examples of that. When man begins to present, so here's the evidence that we have found that there was an ape-like man millions of years ago. What they are presenting to you is the interpretation of the evidence. When you get to the evidence, it may be just like the fingerprint was on the gun. Big deal. So were a number of other people's fingerprints on that gun. We'll talk about more of that in just a second. I want to suggest to you the missing links are still missing. The evolutionists have the burden of proof to provide the transitional missing links between man and ape. It is not my burden or your burden to prove that they're not there. But if you believe in the theory of evolution, it is your responsibility to present some evidence wherein there is this transitional form that took place. Where is the transitional fossil? Where is that transitional record? There should be a vast transitional record. Darwin himself admitted that. Here's an evolutionist who said this, the primary scientific evidence is a pitiful small array of bones which, from which to construct man's evolutionary history. That's his own admission. This is an evolutionist who said, when we look at the, the vast evidence, it's not very vast, there's a pitiful handful of bones that we're supposed to, to build our history upon. We haven't found many. Here's another evolutionist that said the fossils that decorate the family tree are so scarce that there's still more scientists than specimen. Remarkable fact is the fact that all the physical evidence that we have from the human, uh, human evolution can still be placed with room to spare in a single coffin. 
You take all the bones of all the, the eight men that have been found. You can break them all together and put them in a single coffin, he said. That's an evolutionist admission of that. What I want to suggest to you is that when the we're looking for that ape type of man, there are millions of these that can be found, false records of, of the monkey. Or the ape, and there's millions of the men. But the question is, where are the millions of these? There ought to be as many, shouldn't they? Darwin himself said there should have been. The evolutionists admit that there should have been. And the question is, where are the records and where is the evidence of discovery of this kind of man in between? We can find one or the other, but we can't find anything in between. But their efforts have been made to find that. Let's begin to list a few. In 1887, there was the discovery of Java Man. The artist has drawn his picture, and the scientists who discovered him had the drawings made that this is what they think Java Man was like. Eugene Dubose found the fossils in the Dutch Indies on the bank of the Solo River near the village of Tremil. And what he found was a skull bone, a thigh bone, and a tooth. This is what they found. That's all they found. You know they didn't find the skin. You know they didn't find the hair. You know they didn't find uh, the muscle tissue. You didn't find any of that. This is all that they found. And from that, they have constructed this kind of man. This is the evidence. This is the interpretation of the evidence. You see the difference? There's a big difference in that. And so when someone said, oh, yes, we found evidence of a man that is a transitional man. Here is the interpretation of the evidence. This is all that they found. Later they found out the skull was actually from a monkey. That's what it was discovered. The thigh bone and the tooth were human. They didn't even belong to the same being. And later it was revealed to be nothing but a hoax. Well, in 1907, there was a Heidelberg man. He was found near Heidelberg in Germany. And what they found was one jawbone. This was all they found. This was the drawing that was published. You see this kind of, if you can tell that, this kind of ape-looking man. And that ape-looking man was what was published in the, uh, the London Times, uh, as, I, as I recall. Uh, that's what he, he looked like. And so that was published in all the newspapers around the world. We have found the Heidelberg man, and here is this transitional man. We have discovered him. Well, you know, they didn't find the full skeleton. They didn't find everything. What they found was one jawbone. And it was an extremely large jawbone for a human jawbone. But that's all they found. And from that, they constructed a whole man. There's a difference in the evidence and the interpretation of the evidence. Don't ever forget that. There was the Neanderthal man. Much has been said about the Neanderthal man found in 1856. There was a group of fossils found in, uh, in the Ander Valley and, uh, in Germany. The evolutionists said this type of man roamed the earth about 100,000 years ago and disappeared about 72,000 years ago. And here's their drawing of what they think he looked like. You can tell he doesn't really look like an ape, and he doesn't look like a man. He looks like one of those transitional men. And so there's the interpretation of the evidence. We found 13 adult skeletons. They found a skull. They found jaw bones. They found other bones there. There is no reason to regard, C.L. Grace said, Neanderthal mentally, his mental capacity as having been different from that of modern man. Then as we begin to look and discover that what we have with Neanderthal man is not anything different than what we have with modern man. What they actually had unearthed was an old cemetery. There was nothing more than modern man. A little further evidence on the Neanderthal man. In 1986, the researchers were forced to reevaluate their long-held views uh, about the Neanderthals due to the discovery of musical instrument items and other personal ornamentation like jewelry. That is, in the same area, they found musical instruments and, and jewelry. That probably wasn't animals, probably wasn't a ape like man. That sounds like humans. Again, in the interest of time, I won't read all the quotations from Bert Thompson, but he said that the burial acts were generally a religious act and usually associated with humans, not anything that was practiced by kind of a half human, half, half man. And the, the fact the Neanderthals must have been nothing more than modern humans that were buried together. And most have dismissed that as just being, that is, even some of the evolutionists have dismissed the Neanderthal man. There's the Piltdown man in 1912. I want to just give you several instances. Time would fail us to go through them all. But I want to give you several for instances, and this is the kind of evidence the evolutionists have presented. In 1912, there was the Piltdown man. And this was found by Charles Dawson, not Darwin, but Charles Dawson in England, Piltdown, England. He found a portion of a skull and a jawbone. And what they found is what you have here. They didn't find the whole skull. 
But they found this portion right here. The rest of that's a drawing of what it must have looked like. So they found a, jaw, a, a skull and a jawbone. In 1953, the Piltdown Man was exposed as a forgery. The skull was a human and the tooth was an ape's jaw that had been intentionally filed and it was also biochemically, uh, treated biochemically to make it appear much older than what it was. That is, they found the jawbone and they began to file and shape it to what they wanted it to be. They began to treat it chemically so that it looks like it's older. And they're forging some kind of concept where we have found the ape man, the dishonesty of the evolutionists. There was a Rhodesian man in 1921 that was found. It was found in a zinc mine in what was then the British uh, Rhodesia of uh, South of Southern Africa. The find was consistent with the uh, bones of three or four individuals, a man, a woman, and one or two children. And since the hip bones were smashed, the designers decided that they thought then these must have been stooped over, much like an ape would have been, or maybe a monkey. And what they found out was, later, in years later, there was nothing more than just modern men that they had found. But they had pictured that as being some kind of half man, half ape. The Nebraska man was interesting in 1922. What they found was in western Nebraska, they found one tooth. One tooth. That's all they found. The tooth pictured here. From that, they have a picture of what they think he looked like from this one tooth. And they published that picture across the nation in the newspapers that they have found the missing link. What they discovered was it was a wild big tooth. That's all it was. And they have built the Piltdown Man. You have the evidence, and then you have the interpretation of the evidence. There's the horse man. In 1982, a little closer to our time, it was found by a team of archaeologists in Spain. <coughs> and what they found there was they found a fragment of a skull belonging to a human child, they said. You see the shaded portion of what they found. They didn't find the whole skull, they found a portion of the skull. And this discovery would place humans in Europe at a much earlier time than evolution had ever predicted. So they had to rethink their, their evolutionary scale because they found this, this uh, evidence of a young child, a human child. And so then they, they, these over-eager scientists reconstructed the entire human from that one portion of the skull. They designed the whole skull and then they designed what uh, the whole body looked like and then they decided what his skin looked like and what the uh, hair would look like. And later they identified it, it's a skull of a six-month-old donkey. That's all it was. And that kind of evidence is presented with the interpretation of the evidence that we have found in the missing link. Now, Dr. Gruntler puts these fossil findings into three, the missing links into to three categories. He said they're still missing. We just looked at the first category, we're not going to take the time to look at the other two. But you'll find many of them to be nothing but bona fide boguses. Where they have filed, where they have died, or where they have constructed from a single tooth, and we've decided that this man walked this way, this is what he ate, this is what he's done. And so there's the bona fide bogus. Then there are some fossils that are nothing but apes. They're not half ape, half man. It's not a transition. And then there's some, like they've dug up, and we looked at a couple of those, where they found to be a, a cemetery of, of humans, and that's all they found. They'll always fall into one of three categories. So what have we seen with reference to the problems of evolution? There are a number of those. It has the problem in that there's no evidence of changes without limits. It denies the law of biogenesis. It denies the law of thermodynamics. It denies the fixity of kinds. The fossil record says, no, there are no transitional fossils. There's not enough time. There's not enough time. Their dating methods don't work. And then the ape man findings, indeed, are found to not prove that evolution is true. Following our services, we'll have another question and answer period in our young adult classroom here in just a few minutes when we're dismissed. For those who may want to ask some questions and pursue our studies a little bit further. There may be one or more present who is not a Christian, who is not a child of God. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in this way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?